Morning, Dan. Welcome to What Bitcoin Did. How are you? Yeah, I'm not doing bad. How are you? Good. Very glad to get you on the show. You put out a tweet thread a while back, uh, which uh, on first first time I read it, I actually read it wrong. Uh, I read about the uh, developing world, the financial sector that the developing world was about to collapse. And I was like, yeah, of course, we know that. Uh, and started reading it, and then I realized I'd read it wrong. And actually, you're talking about the imminent... The world, yeah. Not imminent, but like the potential eventual collapse of the economic system of the developed world, uh, which obviously is quite concerning um, because that would impact the developing world anyway. Um, but it, but it's very concerning because I've been making this show for five years. It's become more of a macro show than a Bitcoin show. Mm. Bitcoin is now really the uh, one of the tools of uh, uh, safety we talk about, but really it's become a macro show. And a lot of the macro stuff is always pointing in a continually worse direction. And so read the thread, reached out to you, said to Danny, we need to get you on the show, and here we are. So uh, welcome. Thanks for giving us the Thank time. Much. For the people who don't know you, I know a lot of people read that thread, it went a bit viral, but like for the people who don't know you, just can you give a brief background who you are? And why, yeah, sure. Well, I mean, do? so I actually started in politics. That was that was my first move. Um, do you remember the Portillo campaign when he tried to go for leader? Yes, So it was I remember. part of that, and that was kind of my exit point because he wasn't successful in that. So I then pivoted and went into finance and I spent the next 20 years in asset management and venture capital. And more likely that was in developing technologies and emerging trends. That took me through to about 2019-ish when the fund I was working on started to wrap up because they tend to have a 10-year life. Um, and I was looking to make a bit of a break then. I had young children, wanted to go out of London, provide them a, an upbringing a bit more like the one I had. So uh, I made that move. Um, and then, of course, lockdowns happened. Now, lockdowns for me changed everything. I thought it was an enormous overreach on the behalf of the government. Um, I mean, just on a on a macro scale, what lockdowns did, I think the UN put out a report saying it put 100, 100 million people into poverty, 283,000 children starved as a direct result of lockdown, and I think, I think 6.7 million entered malnourishment as a result of it. And that's just sort of the global effects. The the effects on the UK also were absolutely enormous. You know, we, we had a health crisis. So um, family-run businesses had to shut down. But of course, it's a health crisis. So McDonald's has to stay open. Um, whether it was done for the best intentions or not, it had the effect of basically pushing, uh, pushing the country in the direction of larger businesses and squeezing out smaller ones. And the effects of that, I don't think have been properly understood even yet. But very early on in that process, because I was so outraged by what was happening, even though personally for me it was fine. I mean, I've got a nice big house. So that summer lockdown I spent floating in my pool. But the good thing, of course, is, is I recognised the effects of the money printing when I saw it because um, I was a finance guy uh, and, and more than that I was a bit of a gold bug. I'd spent a long time looking at the effects of what was going to happen to our money system. So when that happened, I started up ringing up friends and family and saying, You've got to get your money into the market now. These are the best conditions I've ever seen. And, of course, everybody thought I was completely and utterly mad. Uh, I, in fact, I had one guy, um, he, he, he turned to his wife and said, he wants us to put money into the market now. And she said, he's off his tree. Does, isn't he watching the TV? But, but that money printing was going to go. It was going to get flushed into to assets. But I also know the longer-term effects was that it was going to impoverish wage earners. It was going to cause a hell of a lot of inflation sort of 18 months out. So I started writing these threads on the only outlet that I had, which was Twitter. And I started talking about a whole, a whole number of things that I thought was wrong with the lockdown approach. But probably where I, my competitive advantage was on that finance side, was on that money side. And those are the ones that really began, uh, that, that got the traction. Uh, and, and people like yourselves and, and, and other people who have been on the show, um, they kindly amplified those and pushed those out as well. So I've had a whole series of threads now on what I've seen coming a couple of years down the line. And the one that um, triggered you to get in touch this time, of course, was that one that I did more recently on US debt collapse. So should we, should we pick up on that one? Should we go on? Yeah, on but, but yeah. I just want to say like, uh, um, so this, this podcast for me has been the journey of, of mm -hmm. being largely wrong about things and learning about where I'm wrong and you know evolving from that. And I, you know, on the lockdown thing, I was pro lockdown at the start. Yeah, I got it very, it's, and it's been a really hard thing to admit you're wrong about. Um, uh, you know, saw the data coming in from China, and then saw the data coming from Italy. Saw the 
news reports in Italy, uh, did an interview with a doctor in London who talked about over a three-day period, went from a trickle to overrun and agreed with the lockdown without having any clear idea of the consequences and was pro-lockdown, you know, yeah. and coming to terms of being wrong and trying to admit and admitting you were wrong is, is a very hard thing. So when government wants to do something, it doesn't do it halfway. It, it has an overwhelming media firepower when it wants to make a big change. And mm -hmm. I don't think lockdown is the last of those sort of things you're going to see. Yeah. Um, maybe this is something we can touch on later in, in this talk, but I think at some point we're going to have a very similar narrative push come with central bank digital currencies. Yes. So it's, it pushes us into a really interesting area because uh, this is the type of show where if I put out to my friends online, on Facebook, say, listen, they're going to be like, you're a conspiracy theorist nutter. Not just you, my, me yeah. as well. I have this pinned tweet of mine which says, how Americans see me, how the Brits see me. And Americans see me as some like crazy screaming liberal and as Americans see me as this... No, Americans see me as crazy screaming liberal and Brits see me as Alex Jones, right? And I'm always conscious of that. How do I... So if if it helps, I'm British and I see you as a screaming liberal. So <laughs> yeah, but you but, but I I see you as uh, uh, as Alex Jones. You're one of those rare uh, rare types. Yeah, who's, who, who, it's who's the same like dynamic that. shifted one unit to the yeah. Yeah, but you're rare out here. But so I'm always thinking it's like how do I best get these ideas in front of people so they don't think I'm crazy and this is real. The CBDC thing is relevant because I put a thing on Facebook once, talked about it. I, I got blocked by a friend's mum who said she's bored of my conspiracy nonsense. And I'm like, in my head, I'm like, I know you are wrong about this. Yeah. Well, you're not going to save everybody. The only thing you can do is save the people who want to be saved. Profound, man. Yeah, that's, that's as close as you're going to get, I'm afraid. Um, and it's frustrating when you see these things happening. It was, I mean, mm. it, was, it was intensely frustrating for me um, dealing with people over the lockdown periods, the people who were very emotionally attached to it. Mm. Um, because it, it became a thing is that this becomes your identity as a good person. Um, and, and I had it thrown at me all the time. Oh, you just want to kill as many grannies as possible. That's mm. the sort of line that comes back to it. And you will get exactly the same thing in a few years' time when it comes to the central bank digital currency stuff. Yeah, which, but, which is why yeah. the narrative is important, threading it in the right oh, way. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. well, let's talk about this thread then. Yes, okay. So, a um, bit like your show, um, of course, I've got lots of American followers. So, I, I, I did it based on the US and I did it based on that um, um, US debt clock. Yes. So, if we want to call that up, if we want to have, have, have a look at the, the US debt clock, um, That's the one I had out in the lavish. Yeah, posture. exactly. Yeah. So, so this is so actually this whole talk that we're going to do is a bit of a theme that you've touched on a whole number of times, especially with, with Greg, because whenever Greg comes on, he always brings up the US debt clock, and you always you always start to look at it, um, and you start to pull on that thread a bit, but it's not the main theme of what you're there to talk about. So you tend to say, "Oh, that doesn't look good." And then you kind of move on again. I think you're being charitable there. I look yeah. and think, this looks fucking insane and there's no way back. Oh, yeah. So, well, let, let's see if we can make you more concerned then okay. over the course of this conversation. But, yeah, so quick look at the US debt clock. Um, total US debt is, is $31 trillion. You know, what does that mean? Well, it's $94,000 per citizen. So you could buy everyone in the US a Porsche 911 if you didn't have that debt, if you wanted to get back to that same debt point. So if people... We're looking at this now, and they see thirty-one trillion, thirty-one point four trillion of debt. Mm -hmm. Who do they owe that money to? Ah, oh, well, um, themselves, each other, pension fund, foreign corporations, the Chinese government. I mean, the, the whole thing with the modern monetary system is it's the the base layer of debt is sovereign debt, and then that is then owed to everybody everywhere else. It's like a spider web of nodes of of, of debt. Leaning, mon lending money to each other, and then it's all sort of netted off. So it's the, so it, everybody is the answer. So a little bit like the crypto contagion we've just been through, where everyone seemed yeah. to own. Oh yeah, well the, the whole crypto contagion is, is just recreating the fiat system on a blockchain. Hmm. Um, so yeah, it's that same dynamic. Okay. Um, but yeah, let's take it forward. Um, it's a quarter of a million per US taxpayer is, is the current level of the debt. Um, so that's enough. Um, to to give everybody in Texas a million dollars, you know, including the children. So this US debt is quite significant. Right, and that's only if you look at the sort of on the books national debt. You start adding in like the personal debt, the corporate debt, um, and then if you start adding in the unfunded liabilities, 
the way that a corporation would have to show these things, um, so you know, social security and Medicare and stuff like that, you're now well over 200 trillion of debt. Now, is that a big number? Well, it's enough to give every US adult a million dollars. So this is a significant debt pile that they've accumulated at this point. Um, and that's what that thread was about, sort of spelling that out and giving those numbers. I didn't want to make this podcast about that, though, because, you know, we're three Brits here. And if, you, if you're going to talk about solutions, I don't have an intuitive understanding as to the relative value of the def of military spending versus Medicare or, or some other aspect like that. And there's probably things I'd miss. Would you say, though, because this is a global problem, the US has too much debt. The UK has too much debt. Oh, yeah, we all China do. has too much yeah, Everyone yeah. has too much yeah. debt. I don't know if there are any countries out there who don't have too much debt, but the majority of the developed countries of the world... Russia doesn't. Well, yeah. But the majority of the developed countries yeah. in the world have too much debt, and they're all facing a cr debt crisis of some kind. Oh, yes. And they've all got similar levers to pull. So if we use the lens, uh, the UK as the lens... Mm it's still probably applicable to other countries. You can oh, yeah, still yeah. use that to understand it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm going to focus on the UK because the three of us can have a more sensible conversation about it, especially yeah. when we start getting into the, the, the solutions because we will be able to say, well, it is clearly ridiculous. We clearly cannot do that. But, but yeah, I mean, if you're, I mean, if you're French... Condolences, but it's it's going to be exactly the same situation in your case. If you're, you know, well, actually, the Italians they got bigger debt. Uh, but I mean, if you're Japanese or US, it's it's all the same story. It's just the details change. But the the story that we're about to go on applies to absolutely everybody because all Western economies are in a mess. Okay, and, and we're, we're going to talk through it and, and try and make sense of it. So let's have a look at this slide. This is um, UK government spending. Um, revenues and the national debt. Now, I mean, I throw this up here. Because... Okay, so we've got people listening. Let's talk through yeah. the numbers a quick. So, so 2016 revenue was 716 billion spending. The, 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 the key point is, if you're listening, don't worry if you can't see the numbers because they don't mean anything anyway. Okay. I mean, take a look at that. So, so um, 2018, UK government had revenues of, of 810 billion. Do you know why 810 billion is? Because I haven't got a clue. No, but the number I'm looking at here is the deficit, 32 billion. So it's like, okay, yeah. there is a deficit but it doesn't feel like that big a gap to close. If you wanted to reduce spending by $32 billion, I'm sure there's a way of finding it. It's when we get here to 2021. Yeah, it's it's the cost of lockdown crisis that that changed um, everything. That sort of, I mean, we would have got there anyway, but it did accelerate it. It did knock it up that, that extra level. If you go back and look at the history of UK government debt, there were periods of surplus and there were periods of deficit. Why do we no longer have periods of surplus? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, we might come to that. All right, good, good, good. <laughs> Do we know but, what 2022 is looking like? Um, well, we've got government projections. Um, but, I mean, the key thing is going to be, you know, what happens on the revenue side. Um, and we know what's happening on the on the deficit side. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the point of this slide is, and I know 70% of your um, viewers are not viewers, they're listeners. Yeah. But it doesn't matter if you can't see this table because we, these numbers don't mean anything to anyone anyway. I mean, I, I kind of know what, a thousand pounds is and i even kind of know what a million pounds is because you know a million pounds you can well it's you know it's like double your house or three times your house or something like that which if, if you're a professional person if you if you work really well you might have a million pounds in your pension pot at the end of the period so you, we kind of know what a million pounds is but we've got no idea what a billion is in any of these numbers mm -hmm. so it, it's no good to us what we really need to do is we need to bring all of this stuff back to the back to the human scale right all economic activity ultimately comes back down to individuals. There are 67 million people in the UK. So if we want to bring these numbers down to the human scale, you know, you can divide it by that. But I don't think that really works because that includes children, tired mm -hmm. people, people who are um, sick and can't work. You know, ultimately... Pro not productive people. Yeah. Ultimately, it's going to be the 33 million people who are economically active. That's where the burden of paying for government, um, for paying for the debt, it all falls on the economically active people, and that's going to be the same in, in, in every country. So you want to you basically bring it back to them. So this is basically the same information, except now we've divided it by the number of economically active people. So you can see that the government is um, collecting £25,000 per economically active person in the UK. Um, they're not collecting all of that from the economically active people. 
because of course, you know, if your kids buy something from the shop, they're paying VAT. If you're retired parents, uh, I mean, they're going to be paying um, council tax, they can be paying VAT, fuel duty. So there's a whole bunch of things that non-economically active people do. But ultimately, the, it, it yeah. comes from one way or another the economically active people, even if they were, even if they've now retired, it's from prior savings. Now, if you look at this, I mean, how, how does that strike you? The government is spending 32 grand for every economically active people. But the, they're spending more than they're getting for each person. Yeah, is the obvious point. Well, that, about, there's about that as 7, well. 000. Yeah, so they need to spend on average seven thousand one hundred twenty to to just just to be level. Yeah, but just on the sheer scale of it, you know, thirty two grand per person who works. That's a hell of a lot of money that the government has accumulated. Um, but that always leads me to other questions. Hmm. I always I want to know what they were doing ten years ago. I also want to know the break. Funny you ask, and I also want to know the break. It's going to sound like I've seen these slides. I also want to know the breakdown of what that is spent. But I don't want yep. to know at thirty-two grand. I want to see the billions. I want to see ten billion. There's hundred billion. I just want to know in my head yep. because, okay. like I say, when I see thirty-two billion deficit mm -hmm. and I look, the government spent eight hundred and fifty billion. I'm like, okay. It might be painful, but surely there's a hundred billion somewhere you can knock off. Well, we, we're not going back to that anyway because of the because of the interest payments. But um, okay, well, but we'll yeah, get to that. The point I'm making here is this just doesn't look right. This this is this is way out of kilter with what you know, and this is divided per person. Mm -hmm. There is no way that we can be maintaining this level. And and the other key thing is you know there's a deficit of, of seven grand per person. Now that's not. Um, per year. That's not investment. That's credit card debt, effectively. That's that's keeping the lights on in the NHS and your local school and, and all the rest of it. Um, and the other thing, of course, is the national debt. So each person has a has a national debt share themselves of about 70 grand. Now, that's you might think that that debt number isn't too bad because you might think, well, I've got a mortgage and that's bigger than that. But with your mortgage, you've got an asset against it. So if you ever wanted to, you could um, pay off your mortgage debt by selling the assets you might even have enough left over to buy a little bungalow somewhere. I think your point here is that it's, it is like a credit card debt. Anyone I know yeah. who's got credit card debt, they haven't got it because they've bought something like useful. Yeah. They've gone to Vegas or they've gone to Ibiza. Mm. You know, they've bought clothes. It's always bullshit. It's consumption. Yeah. yeah. And, that, and that's exactly what it is here. So if you knew somebody who had, you know, credit card debt of 70 grand, you know, they've, they've got a problem. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're fucked. But... Let's answer your question because you okay. asked, you know, what, what did it used to be like? I didn't pick 10 years ago. I actually picked um, 2000. Okay. So this is what the same picture was in 2000. Um, now there, it looks a bit high, doesn't it? But it's not that bad. So, you know, revenues, government revenues per worker, 13 and a half grand. Government spending per worker, 13 and a half grand. So just a quick question on that. So that means the government revenues doubled in 20 years because it's now, because the previous slide was, what, 26? Yep. Yeah, 24. So it's about doubled, right? Yep. So that, that would say it's quite productive in terms of you know their revenue. Yep. Uh, but their spending's like, what's that, two and a half X? Yeah. A bit more, yeah. About, okay. about that, yeah. Okay, so that was it, but still had a service, and they're servicing their debt at that time. Yep. Okay, interesting. Um, and, and they're not adding to their debt. And again, bring this back to the human scale. If you knew somebody back in 2000, who um, had credit card debt of 14,000, you'd be like, mate, you've got a problem. Yeah, a bit of a moron, but you can sort that yeah. out. Just but, like stop spending. But the, but the key question you'd ask is, are you adding to that every year? Yeah. And if the answer is no, it's it's flat at 14K. No, you'd be like, look, fucker, yeah. cut that shit up, put it yeah. in the bin. Like, you don't yeah. need to wear Gucci. Like, sort it out. You, 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 can, you can recover from that, no yeah. problem. Um, now, average salaries were lower back then. I'll put the average salary back on there, you know... Um, just shy of 20k. So if you had a mate who was earning 20k a year with 14k of debt, you know, like you say, sort it out, you can get there. And that was sort of the choice that we had back then. Mm -hmm. You know, we could have gone either way. We could have said, okay, well, look, this is starting to get out of control. We're going to nip it in the bud. We actually went the other way and we pushed the spending up and the, the defi deficit up considerably. Okay. So, um, you know, we, we, we took a turn. But the reason I wanted to talk about 2000 is because I remember 2000. It was fine. I mean, we had roads. We had hospitals. But how old was I? Just got out of uni. Just got a house with my best mate. We're on yeah. the piss every night. Yeah, I had a credit card. And we might be viewing it through sort of rose 
tinted goggles because yeah. we were like 21, 22 back then. Um, no, uh, look. But the country was all right, wasn't it? I mean, no, it, it wasn't was falling apart. No, uh, you know what? It, and this is one of the things, like, I was talking to Danny, we were driving down on the way, and it's like, the NHS has never had more money and it's never been more fucked. Yeah. And I can't understand... Like where, why all these things are crumbling? Well, I, I have my suspicions, but we'll, let's carry on. We'll come to that. Yeah, I mean, so, something has clearly gone wrong between now and then. Mm -hmm. um, depending where you are on the political spectrum, I suppose we'll describe what you think has gone wrong. So if you're on the left, you're going to say, well, what's happened since then is that corporations have become greedier. Yes. If you're on the political right, you might say, well, there's been five million plus in immigration since then. Mm -hmm. um, if you're a Bitcoiner, you're going to say, well, the money system itself is flawed, which um, has resulted in governments um, always spending more than they can, uh, more than they can collect. Um, and because the money is generated at the nexus between government and finance, those two areas have ballooned disproportionately compared to the rest of the economy, and therefore wages have got squeezed out. Yeah. And if you're a centrist, like I am... Oh, uh, yeah, go on then. Uh, I would say uh, this is the result of successive governments uh, using spending as a tool to win votes and maintain their position in government and uh, being irresponsible. My analogy is if I had a printer in my bedroom and I could switch it on when I wanted and print some cash and go and buy whatever I wanted and never had to pay it back, I would use that fucking machine. Mm. Mm. And, and, that, and that's what they did. And the only reason they, they didn't do it more is because it used to be a taboo. But, I mean, they've been doing that since, what is it, 1973 in this country. We went off the gold standard. We did it two years slower than the Americans. But, yeah, since I then... I thought we came off the gold standard before the Americans. Did we? I thought I it was in the 40s. Did. Yeah, I, could be I wrong. think we No, there was, that, there was that residual link because mm. there, there was a time where you could walk into a bank and you could change your £10 note for £10 worth of gold. And I think that was still the case in the late 60s. Mm, maybe. I, thought, I, I always thought we, like, we were the first to come off. But Danny will fact check us on that. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, wrong with that. So... We know that the government has a bit of an eating problem. Mm -hmm. So bring it back to today, again, meeting a mate. You know, let's say you went back to Bedford and you saw a schoolmate that you hadn't seen for a few years. Um, his name's Bob. And you, you meet up with Bob and uh, Bob's earning 50 grand a year now. So, you know, that sounds pretty good, right? I mean, 50K, perfectly, perfectly reasonable salary for a man in this country to earn. But what does that mean in terms of, of tax? Well, first thing to remember is that before Bob gets paid his 50 grand, the corporate entity that he works for, that's already paid a whole bunch of debt. That's right, a whole bunch of um, tax. So they would have paid VAT, corporation tax, employers' national insurance, fuel duty, and a whole bunch of other taxes would have come out before it even got to him. Right. Then when it hits his pay slip, um, you're going to take out 12 and a half grand for um, tax and national insurance. So your mate Bob is now left with about 38k. It doesn't stop there, though. Because then he's got to pay, um, I mean, it depends on where in the country he lives, but he's going to pay a couple of grand in council tax. Mm -hmm. He's going to pay you know, full fuel duty of about another grand. He's going to pay VAT, depending on how much he buys, maybe another four grand. Um, and then other taxes, let's call it two grand. It would be more than that if he drinks and smokes a lot. But, um, you know, you're down to 29K um, before you've actually done anything. And on top of that, I think I'd make the argument you probably want to treat inflation as a tax as well. Um, you could say maybe it's not, but, you know, it's it's basically coming out of your... Oh, no, it is. Yeah. It is a yeah. tax. Yeah, yeah. Because we know what causes it, which is government spending, expanding the money supply, and we know it is, it is essentially a hidden tax, a way to fund more things they can't afford. So, agree. Let's treat that as a tax. Okay. Um, the current official inflation rate, which is obviously wrong. It's obviously higher than the official rate. But let's just go with the official rate. It's at 10% at the moment. So let's take another 10% of his salary off um, and treat that as a tax. So that's another 5K. So we're now down to 24K, less than half he's, what he started with. And the only thing that we have bought at this point is our government. He hasn't he hasn't bought anything else at this point. I mean, I know we take we subbed off the VAT, but you know, now, right? Now feed yourself, pay the mortgage, feed and clothe the kids, and save for retirement so that you can pay half of those taxes all over again. Because even when you retire, you're still going to be paying VAT and council tax and fuel duty and all the rest of it. I think there is a lag between what we believe is a good salary and what a good salary actually is. Because I still think people think, you know, 50 grand is a good salary. And yeah. you know, for a lot of people it is. Don't, 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 I'm not being disrespectful here. For a lot of people it is. 
but you're so heavily taxed and things have got so expensive, especially like energy now, mm. that actually at 50K a year, you've still got to have, you've got to be very considerate about how you, where you spend your money. And the problem is we've got is most people, it's not just what they earn, right? They want a car and they probably want a Beamer or a Merc or something, right? They want to live in a nice house. They want at least one holiday a year. They've got to pay for Christmas. Yeah, they've got to. Yeah, they want to go out for dinner occasionally. Well, I mean, there is that as well. But then, I mean, their money is getting taken off them so fast that you might as well spend it while you can. Because well, I yeah. think there's just well, I think there's two things going on here. There is the money's being taken off them, mm. and then there's been this societal shift, pr- societal shift with pressure to spend in, in ways consumption. Yeah, yeah, consumption. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Mm. But no, you. I mean, you say that you know, fifty k is not what it used to be. So let's go back to that. The other time period we're talking about is two thousand. To, to give that comparison. Can you do you want to guess how much you would have to be earning in the year two thousand, so that um, you, you've got a purchasing power of of fifty k today? Well, I've got to count for twenty years inflation and the changes in tax. Thirty five k. Well, no, I'm, I'm thinking I'm thinking the other way. How much you'd have to earn today to oh, to, to, to have yeah. what you had then? Yeah. Gosh, seventy five k. I'm pulling a finger. So out according there. according to the Bank of England, it's eighty two k. Wow. Yeah, and that's the Bank of England, which again is using the CPI, which we know is a dodgy method, which undercounts inflation. So it is at least 82K to hold steady with, you know, somebody from from 20 years ago. So inflation has definitely been sort of eating over this period. Right, now let's get on to the the question you asked earlier. Where actually is the government money going? And I'll throw this up, and and for the people listening, this is a big table of all... um, current UK government spending, and I'm using the numbers here from the last budget for for the previous year. The only change that I've made is I've used the current number for the debt interest because I thought that was more accurate because that is actually what we're going to be paying. Okay, so the biggest spend is national, the NHS, Yeah, which I'm a fan of. I'm less of a fan. But I'm very conscious I'm in the luxury position that I can afford private health care, and my kids have private health care, and there was a time when I couldn't, and the time when my parents didn't have it, and we relied on the NHS, and my mum worked for the NHS, and I just—it's a big—it's a whole—it's a whole other podcast to talk about the NHS. But let's we're, just, we, we're going to have to touch on it briefly, yeah, so, we, so we might as well touch on it very briefly here. But my my, my, my take on that is um, what people like about the NHS is that it's um, provided for, that the government pays for it. That doesn't mean the government needs to also provide it. Well, so. So our, our country's relationship with the NHS is like my relationship with my son, in that whenever they need more money, they get given it, whatever the consequence. Oh, in this country, it's a religion. Yeah, and my son's yeah. at university. <laughs> Literally, Danny heard me on the phone to him yesterday because he wants to go out with his mates and he wants some money. I was like, oh, fuck's sake, right, but will you get a job? Like, it's that similar kind of yeah. uh, relationship. Oh, yeah. But so for people listening, the NH, the total spending of the government is $1.1 trillion. The NHS is 200 left. So it's about 20%, 18%. Yeah. yeah. So so the NHS is the biggest item on there. Then you've got pensions. Then you've got... Uh, Public wealth. pensions. So just yeah. explain what that means to people on here. Uh, well, when you get old, you get some money. The go- There's the government yeah. pension. It's, it's, it's this government pension provision. Which we, is nearly... It's a big item. Yeah. What's that about? Have we got percent- Can you do the percentages down? Is, about, yeah. is that about 15%? Yeah, I didn't do the percentages. But, um, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Big okay. And then after that, it's welfare... Okay. And, then, and then after that, the numbers start to tail off quite quickly. So education's so, about educa- 10%. Yeah. Defence about 6%. Yeah. So what's state protection? Well, that is that is literally protecting the state. So police, courts. Okay. So protecting the state from dangerous people like Julian Assange, who otherwise could, could do all sorts of damage to the state. And do, you know, do you know I interviewed his uh, wife? I saw that, at, yeah. Right here. Yeah, yeah. In the studio. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. The, honestly, the Julian Assange thing more than anything else is what made me realise that the state is, even if it's unconsciously, is functionally our enemy in almost every way. Well, it's the, the, the way that he's been treated. Yeah, uh, I've got certain words I like to use for Preeti Patel, but my brother tells me off for that. Okay, yeah. uh, transport. F- okay, what part of transport is that? Is that right. funding? I mean, all of it. Yeah, roads, roads, railways. I mean, anything, okay. anything transport related. Does is, that inc- does it, does that cover say? Uh, OAP's free bus pass, or does that go under social security? Oh, good, good. I have no idea. Okay, fine. I've, I've no idea on that. Okay, but the point that's is, about 5%. Once you get down to there, it starts to tail off quite quickly. Okay, let me tell you some interesting stuff about this table. So, debt interest I put down there at the bottom at 120 billion. Okay. Okay. So, that looks 
big compared to any of these. But let, let me tell you that actually most of these numbers, okay, um, they're including a whole bunch of non-cash items, accounting entries, depreciation, that kind of stuff. If you strip those out, the only one that's bigger than the debt interest is the NHS. Okay. Because what the NHS actually has at its disposal to spend is about $144 billion. Mm-hmm. So when you compare that to an interest line of 120, that's the second biggest item. And it won't take long for the debt interest to overtake the NHS. Other public services, that just wraps everything in that you can't like. But I, just yeah. still want to, I still want to know what other stuff is in there at some point, but that's fine. Well, you, uh, um, I got this from the budget, so you can, yeah, you, you can just download a copy of the budget and you can you, you can go into it to get all the details if you want. But I okay. mean, th- th- these are sort of the headline numbers. So the interesting thing, mm-hmm. debt interest, $120 billion. Yeah. We saw those deficit figures. Let's forget COVID just for, for now. Let's park it for now because that year was an anomaly year. Okay, but generally speaking, the debt uh, the deficit was between thirty and sixty billion most of those years, right? If we had no debt, okay, if we had no debt, we would be able to fund our spending based on our uh, income as a country. Uh, no, 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 we're still. But hold on, those years we were between thirty and sixty billion. If we spend one hundred twenty billion a year f- uh, uh, on debt interest, yeah, the, the deficit is bigger than that. It's like. 200 something. No, no, hold on, hold on. Let me explain myself in a different way. All right. Is that debt interest that's going on to the national debt or is that repayments per year? Are we paying oh, no, that, off that, that, No, that's having to pay um, bondholders right now. So that's money so out that's the door. That's service in debt. Yeah. Okay. What I'm saying is if we yeah. had no debt, mm-hmm. our spending would drop by 120 billion. Yes. Therefore, we wouldn't. We no, would, the deficit would, is bigger than 120 billion. No, no, on, on, a, on an annualized basis. Uh, go 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 back to the chart. Which which keep one? Going, keep going. Okay, 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 here. See. Yeah. So deficit two hundred and thirty. Yeah. So that's year twenty twenty one, which is COVID. Mm-hmm. So let's forget that because that's an anomaly year for now. Twenty twenty, our deficit was fifty five. Well, no, it's 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 maintaining at those levels. What do you want about? Well, so so the deficit is still large. I mean, in, in its in its future projections, I mean, yes, it has it coming down a bit, but it's still over the budget line. Over Sorry, the, I think I think line. you're missing the point. I'm saying is between 2016 and 2020, yep. if we had no de- debt to service, mm-hmm. our revenue would have been higher than our spending. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what the interest expense was. I'd have to I'd have to go back and check that. But, but it, remember, the interest expense was a lot lower only a few years ago. Yeah, but e- e- even there, if you look from 2020 to 2021. We've gone up by twenty five percent. Okay, yep. so even even with that, we would know that take that one hundred twenty down. It's say ninety yeah. billion. What I'm saying oh, is, it, it was it was a lot lower than that. I mean, um, I, I wish I had the, the the budget thing to open in front of me now. But yeah, the, the 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 debt interest line has gone up significantly in the last well in the in the last sort of year or so as interest rates have gone up. But but I think our problem here is successive overspending that if we hadn't have done, mm-hmm. we hadn't have borrowed money, live within our budget, our economy would be fine. In the alternative situation where we didn't overspend, then yes. It's the accumulation of debt. It's like yeah. it's like when you've got the credit card mm. and you keep spending, even though you've got your credit card, you get to the point where you're bankrupt. Yeah, and it becomes a habit. If they'd never taken out the credit card... They could have always. We'll go back to the years of surplus and deficit, surplus and deficit. Yeah, well, that's why I like the showing the slide with the two thousand on there because if government at that point had realised, you know, yeah, we've got a bit of a national debt, and from now on, what we need to do is we really need to tightly constrain this, make sure that we don't grow the the revenue line, then yeah, we would be in a completely different place now. The cancer but, here is there's no short-term consequence to pressing the money printing button. There is a long-term because it's a lag. Well, well, if anything, it's the opposite, isn't it? There is a short-term cost to not pressing the button. Yeah. Because then you don't win the next election. Yeah. So every election is always a question of, you know, how can I bid for votes through public spending, which is going to be paid for by your kids? But you, you can't be... You can't push it too much because Corbyn tried and people aren't stupid. They're like, hold on, how are you going to fund free broadband for everyone in the country and free units? Like, he, people, the people knew, yeah. like, he We catches it up much. with you eventually. But, yeah, but people we're knew there. that. Mm. People knew that. But now we're at a point where you can do it a little bit and you kind of have to. Nobody is going to. The conservatives, well, they're fucked anyway, but even if they weren't fucked. They're not going to stay in buy power by going, look, we need austerity, we need to reduce spending, we're going to cut our spending, we're going to cut these services, because Labour kind of say, we're not going to cut them. 
Oh, the, the, the situation is hopeless at this point. The problem with debt is the political cycle. The problem with managing the money is the political cycle. That is the fucking cancer of this. Well, the, the political timescale does not line up with the economic no. timescale. No. I mean, that much is clear. Like, I asked this question on Twitter once and it sounded dumb, but, like, I think if a government overspends, it should trigger an election. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, so um, I mean, if, if we get a chance at the end to talk about what I would do differently politically, I would elect a government with a budget. Yeah. And as soon as that budget is, yeah, they, they immediately then have to go back to voters. I'm literally having these fucking conversations yeah. with my son at the moment. He's gone to university, right? He's 18 years old. Sorry if you're listening, Connor. Sorry you're always a case study. He's 18, right? He's mm. gone to university. I gave him some money at the start to enjoy his first couple of months, and I've right. given him a budget. And he's finally got to a month where 10 days before he's like, can I have my money early next month? I'm like, no. But what I will do is I will fund you to the end of the month. What you need, send me a budget. I want a line by line budget. Okay, he did it. He did a shit job, but he did it. And then, anyway, he gets back in touch. He's like, "Dad, can I have uh, Christmas early money? Money early? Uh, Christmas money early?" I'm like, "Why?" So, like, oh, my mates are going out. It's like, "Have you got a job? Have you done a budget?" So now what I've done is I've moved him to a weekly. He doesn't get his money monthly now. It's weekly. All you have to think about is the next seven days. Yeah. I am teaching him to budget. Okay. And, and understand money. Why the fuck does our government not do the same? Well, if you could do the same exercise with your MP, then that would be great. I would love to do yeah. that. And I would love people to understand this. If yeah. people understand this, they would know that the cancer is government. Not the left, not the right, it's government. God, I yeah. sound like the people I... I sound very unstatus right now, don't I? <laughs> Well, well I, I was kind of walking us towards that, but you, 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 I'm getting angry. You, yeah, you, you, got, you got us exactly there. That, that, that is ultimately the problem. So look, yeah. we know that we've got a government problem. It's spending too much. It's trying to collect as much tax as it can. Um, but typically, tax the, the amount of tax that a government can take tends to get stuck between 34 and 36% of GDP. Yeah. You can push it above that for a very short time, and then it almost always then collapses down on the other side because... Behaviours change, incentives change, people move work <laughs> offshore, they go to four days a week, they do all that kind of stuff. So we know we've got a problem. Let's talk about what solutions there might be. And I've come up here with four solutions. The, 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 this is a solution to prevent us going bankrupt. Yeah. No, this is, well, yeah, this, this is to save the system effectively. And when you say save the system, if we don't, what is, what is the TLDR on oh, the messy financial collapse? I mean, it's, yeah, it's... It's bondholder revolt. The, the whole the whole thing comes down. Okay, so saving the system is good. Um, what are the four solutions? The four I come up with is one: default on the national debt. Two: cut the spending. Three: tax the rich. Four: raise growth. Now, or a mix. Well, yep, possibly. Yeah, we we'll come okay. to that as well. Um, the reason I picked those four is because those are the four that you hear all the time. Um, you know, man in the pub. Economists on Twitter, they all essentially, I mean, every, every solution ultimately comes back down to these, um, with the exception of the first one, the default on debt. I don't hear anyone ever talk about defaulting on the debt. Because that's what uh, Brazil and Argentina and Cyprus does, not, not the United yeah. Kingdom. Yeah, N nobody is up for this. Um, but, you know, here's the crazy thing, okay? I think default on debt comes at a time where there is literally no other option. But it's crazier than that. Because let's say that we, we default on the debt. We wipe it all out. We say, sorry, bondholders, you're not getting paid. Sucks to be you. It's just gone. Forget about it. Move on. Okay? Here's the crazy thing. Because of the deficit that we're still running, so you, that 120 that you talked about, mm -hmm. you knock that out, you're still running a deficit, and you get back where we are here in 15 years. Do we know what the difference is this year? If the gap... If, if um, yes, so it's 146 billion if you knock out the interest payments. So, so it's 260 billion. Um, yes, this year, yeah. I want to know what the increase in spending was in 2021 because of COVID, and I want to know why that hasn't come back in 2022. Well, it's it's thought the lockdowns cost us about 500 billion. Okay, but is are we seeing a spike that will come back down? Well, it naturally... Um, well, there, there were certain items in there that won't be repeated. Well, they say they won't be repeated. I mean, what was it like 37 billion was spent on track and trace, something, something yeah, like that? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Oh, and they're talking about 100 billion on energy. 
Yeah. So, so there were new problems. There were new yeah. problems now. So, yes, we're not we're probably not going to do drag and trace again. But there's a whole bunch of other things we are going to do. But the crazy that's the crazy thing. So, even if you wiped out that debt, we would still be back at the same um, 2.3 trillion debt in 15 years, just by letting the current deficit run. Well, so, so you have to get rid of it, and you have to cut spend. You have oh, to yeah. do the two. Well, if, if yeah, if you wanted to, if you wanted to do it that way, yeah. But is there also another risk? If you did that, the pound value will collapse. Oh yeah, so we're on line yeah. item one at the moment. All right. Okay. So all I'm, all I'm saying is is that even if you did it, it wouldn't solve your problem because all you would do is kick the can down the road fifteen years and then be back here. And that's assuming that government doesn't increase its spending, which it has shown a clear propensity to do. So you'd probably be be back here before fifteen years, right? So so here's some more problems with this idea. Um, you also wipe out um, basically the pension system because pensions hold a lot of guilt. Um, so all of those uh, pensioners who thought they were going to be independent, suddenly they're not because uh, you've taken away their pensions and all of the taxes that you thought you were going to get from them, you're now not going to get because they're going to be immiserated. And, and so that deficit is going to go up even more. Can you stagger it? Can you prepare for a future where... So what I'm going to do, what I'm doing in each of these scenarios is taking an extreme position. Okay. And the reason I'm doing that is because I'm going to demonstrate that even that extreme position does not solve the problem. Okay. But because it's an extreme position, it is politically unviable. So that, okay. that's the way okay. to think about All this, right. okay? You do more than that. Because you've wiped out the sovereign debt layer, you just wiped out the financial system. Okay. Because since 2008, we moved the problems from the banks to the sovereign and then gave the banks a whole load of sovereign debt to be their collateral layer for everything that they do. So you're going to need to explain that simpler terms? Level one for everything the banks do and the financial system does, it yep. all starts from sovereign debt. That's their basic collateral from which they then go off and they make other, well, other actions, other things that they do, other investments they make or other loans that they make. Okay. So if you knock out the base layer collateral, you sort of domino collapse the entire system. Okay. And the UK is not a closed loop. UK debt will be owned by many other foreign institutions, foreign governments, foreign banks. So it's not like you can just evaporate the UK from the system. If you did this, if you knocked out UK sovereign debt, you would cause a domino effect that took out the entire Western financial system. Hmm. That's why, if you remember, back in 2008, we pushed so hard against Greece failing. We weren't actually desperately worried about the Greek banks failing and the Greek sovereign debt going. The knock-on. But it could have been sufficient to perhaps cause the Italian banks to start to fail. And that would then cause the, the Spanish and the French and the and before you know, the whole system is gone. This is like the thing that keeps coming up about the US defending the euro. Yes. They won't let the euro collapse. Yeah, yeah and I, th I think you did a show with Lynn Alden where she yeah. took the entire monetary system at a really zoomed out level and said, well, basically, look, it's it's just a series of, of banks owing other banks money. And then the um, Bank for International Settlement, I think she said, um, basically just nets it all off and says, okay, well, you know, at the end of each day, you need to move money to here and here and here. But the, it's the whole, system, the whole system is leaning on each other. It's just a series of nodes pushing against each other. So if you take, if, I mean, if you, and, and the thing in 2008 was, was what if the, what if the Greek go, node goes dark? And we were worried about the contagion collapse that that could have. You know, if you took out an economy the size of the UK, obviously the whole thing is just going to go. Domino effect would kick in. So not only does defaulting on the debt not solve our problem, it would cause a complete collapse of the financial system, which would cause a complete collapse of supply chains, global famine and death. Because I mean, what's the incentive for the farmer to deliver food to the wholesaler? Mm. Yeah. Or the wholesaler to the shop. In fact, how is the wholesaler going to get a diesel delivery to doing it? The, the whole the whole chain, because our entire system is a series of transactions and the half of each of those transactions is money. Because if you knock out money, I mean, it all goes. Yeah. Okay. Now, maybe in 10 years' time, there will be a some sort of permissionless money system um, which is widely adopted. Everybody knows how to use. The user interface is great. All the custody issues have been solved. Everyone's comfortable with it. Uh, and at that point, you could let this system collapse and move on to this alternative system. What kind of crazy system <laughs> would that be? I don't know. So, somebody might come up with one. One coin. <laughs> but we're probably not there yet at the moment. All right, all right, okay. So this doesn't work, and you can see why nobody talks about this. So this isn't a great solution. Okay. Right, what about cut spending? <laughs> That's crazy talk, man. Yeah. Okay, so 
And here I've calculated what you need to do in order to get the... Um, uh, well, first of all, I'm wiping out the deficit, so I'm cutting spending by that much. And then I'm going to say, okay, let's repay the national debt over 20 years, and which basically means you turn that debt interest um, payment um, of 120 billion, you flip it the other way, and it's now re you, you do a repayment of that much as well. So it's a 200. It's basically a quarter of a trillion flip. Yeah. Okay. And this is what it means for those numbers that we looked at earlier, those departmental budget line. Okay. It means taking 76 billion out of the NHS. Budget. Okay. Is there a chart that shows NHS spending year by year? Danny, have a look. I want to see when they were last spending 135 billion a year. This would be interesting. It will probably 136 be... 136 billion. Go on, both guess. Uh, I, th I think it will be less far back than you think because the growth becomes... 2012? 2013, 14, they spent 130 billion. I mean, I kind of saw it anyway, yeah. so I was cheating. Yeah. And right. what was it last two years? Those, they're two anomaly years. Uh, 201 and then 200, basically. And then they're saying it's going to come back down. Projecting. But, it's, but I mean, by, by 2024, 25, they're projecting 185. So it's, and I wonder if the trajectory up is based on inflation. Yeah, probably. Or an aging population? At least partially, yeah. Both, probably. And I'm sure many more factors. Okay, so yeah. you need to get it back to 2012 levels. Okay, yeah. fine. Now, and bear in mind, I said earlier that the total budget, that includes a whole load of non-cash items. Mm -hmm. So the actual bit that they get to spend is 144. So if you're taking 76 billion out of it, you're effectively halving the amount of money yeah. that the NHS has got to spend. Now... You know, this is why I wanted to look at this from the UK perspective rather than the US perspective mm. because we can we can contextualize. Yeah, it. as three Brits, what do we think the possibility of a political party getting elected, promising to halve the budget of the NHS? Zero. Two chances, none yeah. of fuck all. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so there has not been a political party, a major political party, that has felt safe going into election for the last twenty years without promising to increase the NHS by more than the rate of inflation. Look, even when the... Because conser the Conservatives are the ones who tend to push this most. And even when they said... like, Not that hard. Yeah, but like because they've tested the waters. They're like, maybe we'll just privatise this one little element over we, here. We'll just and modify like, a bit. Yeah, like, fuck you, keep your hands yeah. off our NHS. It's like that. They get shut down hard. It's like that gun debate with the NRA where the guy's <laughs> like, maybe we'll ban the big guns. They're like, fuck you, don't touch our guns. Yeah, you, you can't... You could, so, for any American listeners, it's basically our religion. It's like it, banning guns in Texas. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe even worse than that. I mean, but yeah, it is it is of that order of magnitude. Yeah. I mean, un unironically, in this country, you will see church altars with an NHS banner draped over the top of them. It is it is this ranks well above religion in this country. The NHS. Yeah. Um, and and if you're knocking out half of its budget, and this is not just the NHS, this is this is everything is on this list. And it's funny you're saying that at a time where we've got. Uh, record wait times. We've got uh, ambulances queuing outside of hospitals. I, listen, I heard today about somebody who, like most people, like oh, if I go to uh, if I go to the uh, A and E, I'm going to be there four to five hours, mm. and it sucks. Somebody's saying today they were there for fifteen hours. So there is no way that you could do it the way that you're doing it now on that sort of money. Well, again, that's why it's a different show. I want to know where they're spending their fucking money. I got a feeling it's on middle management bullshit. But anyway, yeah, I mean, it will be some of that. It's very difficult to so. When I when I came out of the city and I had a, had a period of doing a bit of consulting, I did do some consulting for local government, and and I was a bit surprised actually because being a right winger, I went in there expecting to find loads and loads of unnecessary waste and padding and all that kind of stuff, and actually I was surprised I didn't find that. What I found was organisations which had basically been created because they thought they were going to go and do something, and they gave it loads of money, and then everything's been through six or seven rounds of cuts since. So what you end up with is. Um, government trying to do a whole bunch of different things, failing badly at all of them because they've been through so many cut cycles, they're simply not effective. But nobody wants to let them go because it's the idea that it does a certain thing. But I don't understand how a budget can go up 50% in 10 years and a worse service be provided. Well, if Sky TV charged me 50% more and gave a worse service... I would become if you went to a local restaurant and it was a fifty percent increase in the price of the pizza and it was a shitter pizza, you were like, I'm not buying your fucking pizza. Yeah, so and like, you do sometimes see restaurants like that, don't you? You just yeah. you just steer to live them. But you know that I suppose I, I I can't give you the the perfect answer on why it is like that. But yeah, religion. it is a problem that we yeah. You've said it already, it's religion. Yeah. Okay. All of all of us in Britain know that we can't do it. So, you know, we we've got to this point where we're looking at the solution 
of cutting spending and we're on line item one and we all agree that this is this is an absolute no-go. You are okay. not getting anywhere near government if you do this. Um, and then look at pensions. You basically, again, you're, you're halving the... Um, the spending of the pensions and, and welfare. There's no way that you could provide pensions and welfare in the way that we're doing them now. It would have to be something like boarding houses. If you feel you can't make ends meet, you ring up the government, the man comes out, he sells your house and all your possessions, he moves you into a boarding house and you get soup three times a day. Well, listen, I, man, I've got a film coming out that I keep talking about this, got to release it. Uh, I went down to Harlow, made a film about inflation and we went to this place called Terminus House and it's a fucking favela in the UK. That's basically what it is. It's a ghettoized. They basically take an old office blocks that are not being used, turn them into apartments, and they filled them for like social housing. Okay, we are heading in that direction anyway. Well, because it's the only cost viable thing that we've got left at this point. Yeah, I mean, there, there are still. I mean, near me, there are you know new modern houses coming out and being used as social housing. So there are. So there is still some. Well, you could call it fat at the system, but. The point is, if you want to go down the route of solving the deficit mm-hmm. and the debt and repaying the national debt, then these are the sort of numbers. And, and look, 38 billion, so effectively half the um, usable budget of the of, of the education department. Okay, n- none of this is tenable. Yeah, n- th- this is complete and utter fantasy as a solution because yeah. you would not get anywhere near government if you tried to do any of this. Yeah. So we've done two solutions so far, and both of them are complete and utter fantasy. Mm-hmm. Taxing the rich. This is the one that um, Ponon left-wing economists on, on Twitter like to talk about, tax the rich. Yeah. And again, you know my approach when I'm looking at all of these. I'm not going to mess around um, with, a, with a half-baked solution. I'm going to go all the way in there with something really radical, um, and we're going to find that that doesn't actually solve the problem. That's the case here. So my no messing around solution with this one is that we are just going to take every single penny from the Times 250 rich list. Okay. So the top 250 richest people in this country, which I think includes Rishi Sunak, I think he's on there at 222. Okay, yeah, we can take his. Um, we, we're going to take the lot. We come back to the practicality as to whether we can actually do that or okay. not. You know, Are they all keeping their money? Is Roman Abramovich keeping all of his money in a UK bank account waiting for it to be seized? Probably not, but mm-hmm. let's assume that you could actually do it. Well, that raises you 653 billion. Right. What can you do with 653 billion? Pay off a quarter of the national debt. Yeah. Or run the government for seven months. Okay, that's the top 250. But, like, did you do other scales? Did you say take 50% of the top 2,000? Yeah, it, it doesn't work either because the next 250, they don't have even a fraction of the wealth that the top 250 have. Uh, plus, they all leave the country anyway. Yeah. And, and that assumes that you could actually get the hands on the money. The yeah. moment you even remotely propose something like this, all of that money would vanish out yeah. of everywhere. And plus, you'll f- it's not just cash in the bank, it's assets you'd force out. It's just, it's, un- it's unfeasible. Yeah. Yeah, and well, and more, you know, bear in mind that, you know, if you did this to the top 250, the next 700, or well, the, ne- the next 3,000 would instantly know that they're on the target yeah. list sooner or later. So, I mean, every... Every person with money and influence and power in the country would turn against you. Okay. So any, again, any government or any um, p- party that looked like it might get elected who was proposing something like this, I mean, you would get Epstein so hard if it even looked like you might get through the doors of Parliament. I mean, yeah. you, you would be suicided into the sun before okay. you got anywhere near this. Okay, that's, so that's unfeasible. Yeah. So option three, completely unfeasible. Then we come to raise growth, which is the favourite option on the right. We just, you know, do the growth thing. And that will get us out of it. Problem with that, and I'm going to slightly twist Greg Foss's words when he talks about this, because he talks about this at a global level, but let's bring back a, a similar version to the UK. Um, UK national debt is, is 100% of GDP. Our servicing costs at the moment are approaching 5%. So you're going to need growth of at least 5% just, just to stay ahead of the coupon. Out. Um, the typical growth range for British growth is about 1.5 to 3%. Right? Mm-hmm. And that was before the damage of lockdowns, mm-hmm. all the businesses that were destroyed. That was before we um, sanctioned our biggest energy provider. It was um, before we really got heavily into the whole net zero thing. Now, if you're going to move from a, um, a high return on energy, energy source to a low return on energy, energy source... Even if you feel that that's exactly the right thing that you need to do, even if you feel it's all for the best, it's going to have an effect on growth. You're going to have, you're not going to get the same sort of returns on that as you would. So 1.5 to 3% is probably optimistic. So you're not going to get 
that 5% growth. And in fact, you, you don't even want 5%. You want some multiple of that if yeah. you're going to grow your way out of this situation. Liz Truss tried growth. She did. And she lasted 50 days. Or maybe even less. How long did she last? Was it just bad timing? So I, th- I think I think that's interesting. One. Because it's whole... very con- it was a very conservative policy. Yeah. But like, as soon as she announced... like, So the first thing, when she announced the tax cut, I was like, I don't need a tax cut. Like, I'm the last person who needs a tax cut. And I don't think that means I... Like, we know trickle-down economics yeah. is bullshit. Like, everyone knows it's bullshit. Like, it's just bollocks. But I didn't need the tax cut. And then she... Issue, like talked about all the kind of increasing spending. I was like, we can't afford this. That was what was in my head. There's something about that whole period that didn't smell entirely right to me. I've got to say, okay, um, because look, we spent we spent 500 billion on lockdown. Yeah, she came up with a proposal to to basically get us out because we are in a mess, and she recognised that. And she said, okay, let's try and grow our way out of it. And she came up with this package of tax cuts um, and pro growth reforms that cost in total about. 40 billion, something like that. So just comparing the size of that to the cost of lockdown, or in fact any of these numbers that we've seen so far, 40, 40 billion is high, but it's not... It's, it's not about su- the same as track and trace. Yeah, it's not super crazy, is it? I mean, it's not completely out on a limb. And, and more than that, the only bit that the, uh, the markets didn't know about, uh, because most of it was, was published in advance, the only bit they didn't know about was the um, the bit that you're referring to, the top rate tax. Yeah. Basically taking the, the top rate of tax in this country down to the level that it was under the last Labour government. And that would have... And some, many economists will tell you that actually if you do a tax cut, it doesn't cost you money. You actually gain money because it re-onshores work and various other things and changes incentives and so on. But let's just say that it was mm-hmm. a, a complete reduction in in income. It cost about two billion, which is half what we're given to Ukraine. So is that hold on? What a tax cut for the wealthiest from what was it forty five to forty? Or was it yeah. fifty? It was a, it was a five pence tax cut at the top end, and it was only worth two billion. Yes, hmm. I'd want to I'd want to double yeah. check that. But anyway, yeah. The, the, well, those are the numbers I've seen. But yeah, we, we can double okay. check. Them. I'm sure we can flash something up if if, okay. if we find something else with that. So it's that that was the only bit that the the markets didn't know about on the day of the mini budget. Right, and then what happened, of course, is that whole snafu with the with the bond yields. Yeah. There were bigger things happening at the time. So that whole time we were sort of experiencing the sort of dollar milkshake theory play out. Yeah. The, the dollar was getting stronger and stronger. Money was flowing into that and away from other central banks. Um, Japan had been beaten up pretty hard the week before. I remember looking at that situation thinking something else is going to blow up. And I was actually thinking it's probably going to be um, the ECB. I thought it was going to be the ECB because of Italian debt, because Italians got a lot of debt. Yeah. Um, and what kind of happened is Liz Truss kind of, at precisely the wrong moment, jumped onto the world stage and said, cooey, look at me. But even then, I'm a little bit suspicious. Um, remember how it played out at the time. Boris Johnson had to go because we had to get Rishi Sunak instead. And it was very clear... But you... R- R- Boris Johnson didn't have to go to Rishi Sunak. Boris Johnson had to go because he was deeply unpopular for a whole number of reasons. Well, you say deeply unpopular. The... And, and I really didn't like him for what he did with, with lockdowns. But um, bear in mind, when we say he's really unpopular, that the poll numbers tell a very different story now to then. Yeah, but, there's he, a, he has... there's a, yeah. but what, there's a different pressure that comes in. Like yeah. the polling might say one thing. I think people would have him back now. The public would rather oh, yeah. have him than what they've got. But what I'm saying, it becomes almost like this, it's like cancel culture. It becomes this pressure that built up. Well, there's that. there was that really strong media push. There's a strong media push. There was reactions yeah. from uh, people stepping down, mm. you know, refusing to, you know. And look, you might say that was a whole consp- conspiracy. I think... The writing was on the wall for Boris for a long time. But by the by, but whatever. I'm, I'm not necessarily saying it's a conspiracy. I'm, I'm saying that clearly a view had been formed and was being pushed that he had to go. Yeah. And it was very clear, if you remember that period, that um, all of the big influencers wanted Rishi to come in. Of course, yeah. They basically wanted a coronation, and that was the thing they kept on pushing. Let's just have a coronation. Let's, let's not even put it to the members. And then it did go to a contest, um, and the voters picked the wrong choice, they went for Liz Trust, and they were never happy with that, and... 
Who is are it, the powers that be that are unhappy with this? Are these backbenchers? Is this the 19th? Oh, I, th- I, think, I, think, I think it's on many levels. I mean, I, I, look, the, the truth is I, I, I don't know. But okay. I increasingly believe that the amount of real power that the average voter has in this country is utterly negligible. I think a lot, of, almost all key decisions are taken at a level um, probably even higher than government. So what is the chain of events you're saying happened to remove Liz Truss? I, I think she was a bit artless with that growth budget. Um, I don't think the numbers were actually that big, as we talked about. The numbers yeah. were, you know, 40 billion is a big number, but not not that big compared to this. Yeah. Um, Two billion on the day is the only thing they didn't know about. This is probably not an analogy I can use on this show, so prepare to edit me out. Um, but... Um, it's not that it was too big. They just they just needed to slow down and lube up a bit, and it would have been fine. But they, you know, those two were just a little bit hasty. But you're alluding um, to almost like conspiracy to get <sighs> rid of her. I, I I don't know. I don't know exactly what I'm saying. I'm just I'm just saying Suspicious. that the, the scale of the numbers themselves did not, to me, justify the the level of the reaction that we got. Um, I mean, what really happened is that. Um, enough people didn't show up to buy bonds on that particular day. And this was during a period where, um, because of the whole dollar strength, money was moving out of other central banks to the Fed anyway, because you could get better returns there. So there was a squeeze happening there anyway. Um, A very small um, tax adjustment came through on the mini budget worth about 2 billion. And that apparently caused enough people to stay away from the next bond issuance to completely collapse the system. Not quite sold on that one. Um, Maybe it would have happened anyway. Maybe um, some of these people who wanted to see Rishi come in anyway um, were all too happy to to stay away that day if they were connected to to institutions that could have bought on those levels. So I'm saying I don't know. Mm. It just the whole thing doesn't seem right. When you look at the scale of the numbers, it just doesn't seem right that two billion unexpected could could, could trigger that. I hear you. I yeah. just, I, just I, yeah. I, I want to know the detail of that, but that's fine. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love to know, and I'm just going to accept that I don't have to know. Yeah. The key point for this conversation is that we had a prime minister who attempted to go down the growth route. It did work. And the shortest serving prime minister... Um, and, and the media narrative was absolutely intense. It was, you know, this is a um, libertarian jihadist trying all sorts of completely crazy things like tax cuts. Okay, so... This is insane. So growth isn't going to work. Yeah. We're not going to be able to raise growth. So, great. so, so we, we, we basically, we looked at our four options um, and none of them were viable. Okay. So, so when, when you have these shows and you talk to people and you say the system cannot save it, well, they say the system cannot save itself, but there is no solution at this point. We've just, we've just walked through it. None of those options is going to be viable. Yeah, but my, my response to that is none of those options in isolation, but is there a mix that can maybe work? Because so, you have presented something extreme and each one in ex, as an extreme scenario doesn't work, but maybe some tax cuts here. Sorry, so some yeah. tax for the rich here, some spending cut there. Well, yeah. I, um, so, I, yes, I have presented extreme um, options in each case and none of them have been sufficient in themselves. None of them have actually solved the problem, apart from the, the spending cut one, which is so politically completely unviable. So, so no measure of that is going to take place. Yeah, but your um, spending cuts were uh, across four specific... No, 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 no. That, no, I only showed four. Yeah. It was across all of them. It was okay. the entire government. I just picked out four to, to show what the yeah. effect would be. Uh, so actually it went deeper than that. Because I wonder, so I wonder if we get back to, like that deficit year, the 2021 is an exceptional year, okay? Yeah, we see a massive uh, difference in the deficit, but we've also seen when we see the NHS spender chart, there's a massive anomaly year there. What I'm wondering is do we get back to deficit levels year on year that are lower, that aren't 210 billion, that are maybe 60, 70 billion? Can, like maybe this is something that's a 50-year Play. Like we gradually get back to. I don't know. I'm, ha, ha, have, have we got fifty years to? I mean, I think I think we're bleeding out right now. Oh, cause look, look. So, I think we are. But what I'm just yeah. saying is, can we get a trajectory towards getting close to a uh, to balance? Even I think it is be- going to come obviously broken um, long before the time scales that this would have to sort of play out on. Okay. Because, you know, you, you look at what the government's doing, and, and it is a little bit of a both. Because what I think will actually happen is that they will select um, bits all bits from the above. 
And it will always be the absolute minimum that they need to pick from the above, which is the least politically unviable, to get them through the next three months. The cancer of the political cycle. Yes. And look at what the current Conservative government is actually doing. They are saying, um, well, they, they put up a couple of taxes, and they say we're going to put up more taxes, and they say that they're going to cut spending, but all of those big tax cuts... And all of those big spending cuts are the other side of the election. And they're not going to win the next election. No, I mean, they're done. Yeah. So they're, they're, they're not actually doing anything to solve this problem. And, and what do you think Labour's going to do when, as soon as they Make take off Make it spend more. Yeah. yeah. They, they are not going to, they're not going to take all of those spending cuts that the, the last government lined up for them and faithfully implement them and go mm. even further. Because even, even the ones that the, the Tories have lined up, all it does is it gets us to a slightly more balanced situation. It, it basically trims the the deficit down over oh, it's like an eight-year period or something like that, assuming all of their optimistic scenarios, all of their optimistic projections come true. So we are going to continue to bleed out. We are going to continue to find that national debt goes up. The trajectory has always been that this deficit increases. Um, you can't, as I said, get the um, rate of tax to GDP much above that sort of 34, 36%. And every time you try it, it sort of blows up on you and comes back. So, ha and, and you've got the inflation coming through in the system as well. And that's, and that's of course, going to be the error term in all of this. So when you can't Meet the meet the obligations in any gear. Of course, they're going to turn to money printing, so that's going to trigger more inflation, which is going to require, which is going to get into the situation we're in now. More so debt servicing. It's basically a death spiral. You're talking yeah, about a death we, are, we are in a death spiral. So debt and, and that's and, and that's spiral. what these numbers show. We're in a death spiral. We, we can't get out of it. Um, if you try and fix it with inflation, you get to the problem we've got now, where you're giving, um, I think nurses is six percent or something like that. I think teachers have had around about six percent is is of that sort of level. And it breaks stuff. So I'm a governor for a, for a primary school. Um, and it was a, financially, we were very well run. We were actually having a, um, a surplus every year. We'd built up a, a bit of a nest egg. Um, but of course, most of the um, expenditure for the school is teacher salaries. So you put a 6% increase on that and it knocks the whole thing out because there's no corresponding increase yet from government to um, increase your, your revenues. So what you're saying is when they offered the pay rise to the teachers... They haven't matched that with more funding for the schools. They're saying to the schools, you figure that out. So far they have. But it's it's not going to work. Okay. Because, you know, my example is we were a very uh, financially well-run school um, and we have been knocked into deficit, which is which is terminal. So there is no prospect. And if, if we're in that situation, I'm guaranteed that 90% of schools are in that situation. Huh. So th that line, at least, is going to have to go up. The NHS line, if you, if you give those... Um, and, and, you, and you say that, you know, that 2021 was an exceptional year. Once you start adding in 6% to the payroll number, which is the biggest cost they have, it's not going to look so exceptional. In fact, if anything, in a couple of years, that's going to look quite, quite a good year. Well, this, this, is the, this is none of the issue. Listen... I have a home budget, okay? I'm, I'm within my budget at the moment. And there are times when I've been out of it, you know, when I have my credit card, and I've generally run a deficit or a surplus through my whole life. Mm. I know right now if I was suddenly in a massive amount of financial problems, I would have to make some harsh choices. Mm. I would have to maybe sell my car or cut my holidays or sell my house and move somewhere smaller. And it would, all these things would suck, but you would have to do it. The country needs to do it. So, if you were the government, how would you do it? How, how would you how would you solve this problem? What would you? I cut? mean, look, uh, I'm not going to give an intelligent answer off the cuff in a podcast. Um, you know, I'm a few grades above moron. So, like, let's be let's be real about this. But but you would have to find a way, and you would have to make it. Yeah. Might be a case of it's the end of the NHS. Now, look, I'm saying this. If you could have the two political parties come together and say, the country is fucked if we don't figure this out. This is something we have to do together. We have to. But, the, but that is not I know, in the I'm, national I'm, I'm, in, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm in cloud cuckoo land. All I'm saying is this is what it should happen. Oh, yeah. And you would be able to find a way to cut $240 billion from the spend, but it, some of it would be harsh. It would be people going without pensions, or it would be the end of the NHS, or it would be, you know, 
NHS only being available to free for people who earn under 15,000 a year and everyone else. I don't know what the answer is, but there would yeah. be an answer. Like, I, when you have to find a way, yeah. if you were told you have, you would have to find a way. Yeah. So, I mean, there is a solution to all of it. I mean, it, it is what well, it is basically what you just said. It is the, the only viable solution to save the system is to cut spending to within its means. Hmm. And that means radical transformation of public services. And, and at this point, it would be truly radical yeah. transformations. It would be schooling to 11 only. And after that, make your own provisions. Now, actually, I think where we got to these days with online learning and YouTube and stuff, that might not be the worst thing in the world imaginable. Yeah. But when it comes to the other stuff, when you move up from there um, and you're looking at um, halving the effective budgets of, of pensions and welfare, like I said, that, that is effectively boarding houses. For the public and they're going to accept that. And for the NHS, it would mean something like, you know, no, no NHS after 50 or, or, you know, something like that. But this way, as I say, it's line by line. I, I can't go to one and go, it's yeah. that and this is the exa- – I, I, it has to be line by line what yeah. can go, what but, can But go. those things I'm talking about, it would have to be – it would have to be all of those, right, and then every other line as well. All of them would have to get mm. cut by that level at this point. And, and that's the thing. This is, this is the whole point of the talk is that it, it is so politically completely unviable. And not only that is that, you know, we're having this conversation now talking about it by looking at the numbers. If we were to exit this room and walk down the hall and find somebody else, they would not even acknowledge the problem. No, nobody watches the mainstream media. You mean they're not aware of the problem? Yeah. So, so I mean, amongst your normie friends, who is talking like this about how do we find a problem to this solution to this government spending problem? What do you think, Sean? <laughs> <laughs> Sean Sean's our uh, uh, our uh, studio producer for the day. Um, be interesting to chat to Sean afterwards, though, because I think this is going to be the first time he's heard this. Because this is this is nowhere in the mainstream media. Nobody is saying that we are running up against the financial buffers here. Well, the funny thing is, this isn't cons- like I'm telling you. There are certain people in my friendship circles or like, my family circles would hear this and say, "This is conspiracy." It's like, no, this is reality. Oh, it's just I've just like, bought numbers from the budget. So, yeah, yeah. These these numbers exist online. The government publishes yeah. these numbers. These are true. Like you tell me an answer. Just tell. Just run through this logically. Yeah. This is why, you know, this is why, I don't know, we need more independent, successful journalists in the UK pushing this shit. But the people within this system must must see this. <sighs> okay, so shall I talk about what I would do if I was them? Mm-hmm. Okay. You mean if you had the job or you were evil? Oh, yeah, if, if, if I had the job and I was evil, yeah. Well, because you'd, you'd have to be, wouldn't you? Because, okay, the thing is... You, so what you think? What you think they're going to do within the constraints of their personal careers? Their bullshit. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. look, you don't get into a position of power without. So the way they stop from from radicals from from getting into these positions is there are a thousand different filters that you need to pass for, pass through before you get anywhere near this level. So anybody who has a a non mainstream approach to this would have been filtered out a long, long time ago. You're saying I've not got a chance? Oh, no. You know, I, anyone who watches this podcast is not getting anywhere near, you know, the reins of power on this. You will be filtered out, you know, a long time before. Mm. So the, the, so what is, what is a solution that is within the mainstream realm of thinking? I know what that is. Um, you need to plan for significant civil unrest coming forward. And we know that they're talking about this because you know you can go on to um, the World Economic Forum YouTube page and you can you can watch their talks. They have spent years talking about significant civil unrest coming down the track. Well, we have a small amount of civil unrest at the moment. I think the the level of strikes we're seeing is a form of civil unrest. It's a protest to begin with, and and I don't think that is entirely accidental. One thing I certainly don't think is entirely accidental is people gluing themselves to roads and Van Goghs and so on because what that's doing is it's gaining public support for a new public order bill. Hold on, hold on, hold on. So you're... so, but you're, they, Therefore, you're implying the people like Extinction Rebellion are really government stooges doing this. Have, have you ever looked at their, their webpage? Speak. It is full of quotes from government scientists. The, the only the only difference Hold between on. are you saying they're stooges or they're inspiring stupidity? I, I'm saying that the, the government and them are singing from the same hymn sheet. Okay, 
Fine. The only difference between the Conservative government and Just Stop Oil is a timing one. The Conservative government want to achieve net zero by 2050. They want to do it by, I think, 2030. Yeah, but what I'm saying is, like, full conspiracy is these are paid actors. Oh, no, no I'm, not, I'm, not saying, yeah. I'm not saying they're paid like, actors. Like, I get it. Like, I was, I, we talked about it at the very start. I believed what the government said with regards to the lockdown at the very start. I was gullible. Because they created a narrative. They created a narrative, and I believed it. But I also, no, I also spoke, I wasn't just a moron. I did speak to a doctor, and he talked about the situation that was yeah. happening in the hospital. And, you know, I've spoken to him since, and his views changed. But so, sometimes I wonder how much of this is uh, uh, insidious decision-making and how much of it is maybe just the natural, uh, like, organic way these things happen because of the incentive models. Yeah, um, I think they've become, to a certain extent, one and the same. Because yeah. as I mentioned, these, in order, to be, in order to be in a top position in a Western government at the moment, you need to sort of ascribe to the whole set of views that become self-reinforcing. Um, and so therefore they reinforce those views, they promote those views because they hold them and they, they you, you don't get into this club and if, if you have a completely different set of views. So, for example, my style of doing economics... Um, is um, well more Austrian school. There are no Austrian economists at the Bank of England or the Treasury, because if you if you if you ascribe to my way of thinking about economics, the solution to these problems becomes you need to scale down the size of government. The mainstream economists they do not factor in um, money and debt into their calculation, so the Fed has never acknowledged the debt. They, they don't think in those terms. They don't. They effectively exclude it from the model, which sounds really weird, but they actually do. They, they just don't think in those terms. And therefore, an increase in uh, money and debt is, is not a problem to them because they just don't factor it into their thinking. So, you know, that's one example of it, but it, it goes well beyond that. It goes through all of the narratives that, you know, we are, I don't think there is going to be any change on approach from a whole bunch of this stuff from the people that we got in there at the moment. Okay. I don't think they're, they're, I don't think they're structurally capable of it. Okay. okay. Carry on your train of thought. Yeah. Right. So, what would I do if I was in there and I was running it, and you said evil, but I don't think that these people are actually evil. I don't think that's their motivation. No, the incentive, the incentive system creates evil output. Yes. But I think they think they're doing the right thing because they cannot imagine anything outside of this system. So they think that the most important thing is to maintain the system. And it's very easy to, to make a good humanitarian case for that because this system provides the NHS, it provides national defence, it provides welfare, it provides pensions. So it is very easy to think that this system must maintain at all costs because otherwise what's going to happen to those poor people? Mm -hmm. So what are they going to do to maintain the system at all costs? And um, as I talked about, it's they are planning for significant civil unrest coming down the track. So what tools do you need to respond to that? I would note that in 2018, um, the Davos event was themed around um, digital IDs. And at the end of it, they produced a working paper that they gave out to governments to say, you know, this is what you need to go and implement at home. And if you want to, whatever country you live in, you can go and search um, for something along the lines of um, uh, rollout of digital IDs, and you will find shortly after that 2018 Davos paper, by a lag of one or two years, there's always a, in whatever country you're in, we've got it here in the UK, their plan on how to roll out digital IDs, and you can look at the two documents, and there's a there's a very clear sort of causal link between between one and the other. We've had Tony Blair pushing it, haven't we? Yeah, well, he, I mean, he's been pushing digital ID, well, IDs for, for, for many, many years, but now we switched on to, to digital IDs. Hmm. So digital IDs gives them a way to um, keep tabs on distance and people to push back against this. The other thing, of course, is going to be central bank digital currencies. Hmm. Um, you put those two things together and you can control a pop. You don't even need policemen at that point. You, you know, if you step out of line, if you're involved in the wrong people, if you're involved in the wrong networks, your ability to spend money outside of the five miles around your house disappears. You know, you're not going to protests anymore. Um, a million and one ways that they can shut you down. Because overnight it'll be untenable. Yes. We're talking about a slow decline, like, like yeah, yeah. a slow way of slipping into this. It's like what happened in Canada. I've had a guy emailing me about this this week, telling me about you know, the protesters and 
you know, how much, uh, uh, how many problems he's caused in Ottawa, Ottawa. And I've been trying to uh, you know, argue back that it was still a peaceful protest. Mm. You know, and and civil disobedience can still be pre- peaceful. And he said, how can it be? And I was like, well, for example, ironically, this example I use, but if you sit on a road and block traffic, that is arguably a peaceful protest because you're not being violent, but it is also civil dif- disobedience. Um, but we've seen what happened. We had people, we literally saw in Canada, a developed nation, people cut out the financial system for yeah. protesting. And retrospectively, in many cases, yeah. Yeah. And so we've seen we've seen it we've seen a domino fall there, yeah. no, and 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 that's a, you know, can't I can't understate how how big yeah. an issue that is. Oh, that is, that is terrifying. Yeah, the government there's now there's now a, an established um, precedent in the in the Western system that if you um, go up against the government, your your bank account could be taken away from you. You can't you can't buy food. You can't pay your mortgage. Um, I think more of that will come. So you know, how would I roll this out? What would I do? Well, as soon as the technology, because we know they're working on central bank digital currencies, they mm-hmm. they've said it. You know, they, the the Bank of England and the Treasury, they they've got the job adverts up. They're hiring people who have the technical skills to build this. They've published papers on how they're going to do it. They've talked about it. You know, one in fact, one of my first big threads was on this on central bank digital currencies, and that was back in the day, just two years ago, when they were still denying vigorously that they're going to do it. Now they're, they've now dropped that, and they've said, yeah, we are actually working on these. So how they, and we know Rishi Sunak is a big, big fan of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he, he's done these videos on them, isn't he? Bitcoin. Yes. Um, Twat. So, <laughs> so, so how are they going to do it? Well, I think what they're going to do is as soon as they've got something ready to go, they're going to co-op businesses into it. And you've got a business which is presumably UK-based, so they're going to come to you at some point and they're going to say, well, businesses from now on have to pay their taxes through this digital CBDC wallet. I think there's a step before there. What's the step before that? Visa and MasterCard. And I know that because one of those companies reached out to sponsor the podcast. I'm mm-hmm. like, okay, that's kind of interesting. Okay. And one of the things they talked about is the CBDCs on their cards. So I think you co-op uh, the financial system. Well, that would be a necessary step if you wanted to get the businesses on board. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, I th- so I think these businesses first, maybe they, they, they line up all the ducks in terms of the Visa and MasterCard as well. Um, and that's really important for them because then you've got a collection of, uh, not individuals, but, but businesses, um, and they iron out the kinks of the process. Um, they see it working. Um, it's a smaller number of people who have better support for when things go wrong. You can speak to somebody sensible on the other side, not somebody who's desperately confused or, or whatever else, but you can speak to the accountant on the other side and you can iron things out. So you can get the process fairly sophisticated. And then I think after a couple of years, they roll it out to individuals. And at that point, it's just optional. Um, and people like us are going to be pushing back at that point, saying, watch out. Um, and everyone's going to say, well, it's it's optional. You don't have to sign up. You know, what, what are you worried about? It works great. Yeah, get that get that tinfoil hat off your head. Yeah. Just don't worry about it. It's, it's, it's purely optional. It's only for businesses and people who want to have it. Yeah. Anyway, do you want a pint? Ping. Yeah. Right. And then um, I think basically they hold fire and they wait for a crisis. They won't have to wait long because there is always a crisis mm-hmm. coming along. Preferably, you want an international one. Well, and at that point, it's going to be, oh well, we need to help people. We need to do a, a subsidy. We need we, we need to do a stimmy like the US did a few years ago. Um, and, and when the when the US did their stimmy, of course, they just they just sent out checks to people. But you know, there was delays and there was problems, and it probably cost a lot to administer the system. And those flaws will get amplified massively in a few years' time when this, when this happens. Um, and they'll be saying, look, the only way that we can do this, we've looked at it, the only way that we can make this work is by a rollout of the CBDC wallet to everybody. And we have to do this because it's a crisis. Don't know what the crisis is, maybe a meteor hits, whatever. Um, but we, we need to get these out to everybody. Right, and that's the point where you're going to start jumping up and down and saying, guys, this is a trap. Don't do it. And the media narrative is going to be so strong that, you know, I mean, I had people calling me granny killer all the time when I was pushing back against lockdowns. You're going to get that times 10 yeah. when, when this comes through because people are going to be saying, Pete, don't you understand? People are struggling. People can't pay their bills. People can't heat their homes. They can't feed themselves. And you're trying to stop them from getting a, a stimulus check. You're going to have it turned on you 
that all guns, all your friends and family at the moment, the ones who basically ignore you know. or, or sometimes call you a conspiracy theorist, they're going to be turning on you and it's going, to, it's going to be very unpleasant because you're going to be, in their minds, standing between them and a stimulus check of whatever's been promised, like four or five grand or whatever it is. Okay. And the whole media narrative is not going to even acknowledge what you're saying. The whole media narrative is going to be how can we enrol the vulnerable onto this? We've got little old Mrs. Miggins over there, and she's not too au fait with smartphones and digital wallets and stuff. How can we make sure that everybody is included on this system? It is going to be like the lockdowns times 10 when this comes. And then, of course, you know, once we've got that and everybody's got this CBDC wallet, um, it's not going to solve the problem because this system, as we talked about this whole presentation, we've, we've, it, is, it is all breaking, it is all falling apart. Um, the inflation effect is going to ensure that you cannot afford to get through the day. So you're going to have to turn it into a UBI system before long. It's going to have to become, at some point, um, £200 a month to help you with the cost of livings. It won't matter that some of us can remember back in 2000 when um, even somebody with no particular skills, somebody who just did manual labour, could live a perfectly good life um, and could, could even get a mortgage, um, go to the pub probably have a holiday once a year. That won't matter. Um, we would have got to the point where in order to, you know, just get through typical living expenses, you're going to need this £200 a month payment. I mean, look, we're already there. In that film I make, I had Dominic, Dominic Frisbee in there talking about inflation. He talked about, you know, I don't remember the exact examples, but 30 years ago, a one-salary family could have yep. all this. A two-salary family now can't afford the same. It's so the whole Homer Simpson mean, isn't it? Yes. So we, we used to look at Homer Simpson as a loser, but now we think, oh, bloody hell, we had a stay-at-home wife and a house. Do you think this is a managed decline because they cannot envisage something else? Uh, yeah, exactly that. It's a managed decline. That, that, no, so, so, well, the key thing is what you said is that they cannot envisage anything outside of the system. So the system must be maintained at all costs. And they know that because people are going to be squeezed, there is going to be an increase in populism. Mm -hmm. um, Western, finance, uh, Western um, electoral systems are very good at dealing with populists. You um, take your preferred candidate, you lock him in a box, you put him in a basement, you fortify the election, and then your guy wins anyway. So we don't have to worry too much about populist candidates. They will be dealt with, and they'll probably be filtered out long before they get to that point anyway. Um, so the only thing you're going to be given is the choice of you know, the, the, the blue team or the red team. And for me, that sort of feels like we're on a, we're on a train um, and we, we're looking out the window and we're thinking, we don't like where this train is going. We really don't like where this train is going. So I'll tell you what, let's, let's vote to change the ticket collector. It doesn't, it doesn't make any actual change to the people on the train, but they feel good because they've done something. Um, and, 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 that, and that's all we're going to do. We, it's going to be for theatre, and it is purely theatre at this point. Hmm. So what, they, yeah, what they're going to do is they're going to, they're going to put in place additional laws to make sure they can crack down on protests. They're going to give us digital IDs and central bank digital currency so that actually, you know, like I said, you don't even need policemen once you've got both of those things. You can, you can shut things down well before that. But, you know, we can revolt. and rev I mean, like China is the worst example of this at the moment. Oh, that's, yeah, it's terrifying, isn't it? But we've seen a revolt there and a change in policy because of the revolt. The zero COVID policy is over because of the revolt, because of the protests, because of the burning down of the encampments. Yeah, so so these um, governments are very, very good at knowing exactly how far they can push before they need to let of course, off steam. Of course, but, but what my point I'm getting to is that it, we need to become very good at knowing how far much we can push no, back. The, the key thing, Peter, is where is China compared to, to where it was before it started? Has the government got more power and control? Of course, yeah. of course. Of so, course. It, so it takes five steps forward and then it takes one step back. Yes. It lets off the pressure and then it's going to wait until everybody calms down because it's going to start going forward again. But almost every country in the history of the world that has gone down the road of too much control, okay, too much socialism, mm -hmm. has eventually seen a collapse and a revolution. Oh, yeah, eventually I'm sure it will come. Yeah. But so, bear so, in mind at the moment, everybody thinks, well, not everybody, I mean, I don't, but a lot of people think that we are a free democratic system at the moment. So people's headspace hasn't even adjusted to what the process that's going on at the moment. 
we still have relative freedoms to a lot of parts of the world. I can still stand outside yeah, down. Relative. I can make this podcast and put it out. I can stand outside down the street and I can say exactly what I want, whereas I might be shot in other countries. Okay. Mm -hmm. What I think we need to do is understand the relative amount of freedom we have and the encroachment, and we need to front run a full revolution. Mm -hmm. And that's why I said at the very start exactly. is how do we get the narrative and the language out so people don't think – you're, you know, because you don't want to be put on the bucket of Katie Hopkins and Lawrence Fox, who say some great things and also most of a lot of times sound like absolute nutters. Like, how do you get this message across and not sound like a nutter? It's the thing that weighs on me the most, Dan. I'm always thinking about, like, how do I translate this? Because, yeah, like, I take the insults and the status cut stuff and stuff all the time. It's because I'm always trying to, how do I translate this to normal people? Yeah, so I think, well, I think what you're doing here, because... So specifically to answer your point, how can you do it? You can do it by... Us, we? Yeah. Well, I'm going to answer you for you, but the way you can do it is by amplifying um, different voices who are pushing back on this and setting the frame differently. So you've had me on. Now, there will be certain people who watch this who will resonate with the way I think, um, and they might want to follow me. I've now got a regular gig at the lotuseaters.com, and I produce a series there called Brokenomics, where I basically take one economic concept a week and explain it, inflation... Uh, interest rates, whatever it is, get into that. You must follow Bernie on Twitter. Bernie tweets. Um, What's Bernie? her name? What's her surname, Danny? That's not her. No. Oh God. I'll find it after. If, if you think of it. So yeah. she's starting to ring the bell a little bit okay. about CBDC. Yeah, you go, got that. Uh, what's her name? What does it say? I don't even know how you say that. You might recognise her from her picture. Just show Dan quick. If you're not following her, oh, I, yeah, yeah, she's brilliant. Yeah, I think but, I've seen that. But Majid, yeah, yeah. Majid yeah, yeah. as well. Yes, he's yes. also good. Yeah. There are yeah, people ringing the bells of CBDCs. I'm going to so, get. So this is this is what you do is you you highlight votes. So so some people will have listened to me and want to hear more, but some people the the way that I think just doesn't resonate with them and, and they're not going to connect. But if you bring on ten people who are looking at this problem through different lens, hopefully one of us works for at least some section of the audience and we provide the arguments and get them thinking about it and arm them with a way, that, way to look at this problem and then they can slowly start and it starts to permeate out. So, so specifically on what you're doing, yeah, you, you basically just raise up interesting voices that can connect with different groups of people. But my podcast is this little niche podcast in the little corner of the internet that a few people in the UK or crazy yeah. Bitcoiners listen to. This is the constant debate. Me and Danny have been having it for like three years. Should we jump out of Bitcoin? Should we go a level above? Bitcoin is our well, common thread. Yeah, but you, you, you've done that, haven't you? You've, no, you've done I'm, it by I'm, turning it into a macro show, effectively. Yeah, but it's still what Bitcoin did. Should it be something else? And sh like, should we be leaping out of that? Except, and look, everyone who listens likes Bitcoin. Not everyone, but a lot of people who listen to Bitcoin like Bitcoin, like the show. Should it be something else? Should it be a show which is like the 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 kind of cultural weirdo layer of society? Like, should we do that? And then, pe like, so people aren't just put off by yeah. Bitcoin. They can they can fucking hate Bitcoin, not care about it, but still understand. This train, this train wreck that's coming. Well, how, how much have we talked about Bitcoin during this podcast? I mean, no, so we've not. Yeah. But, so, what but this, I'm is the, is, this is the thing. So if somebody, if somebody watches this and it resonates with them, and they want to go and show it to their friend, you know, their friend might say, "Oh, it's Bitcoin." It's like, no, no, it's not Bitcoin. Just, just watch it. And then all they've got to get through is like one second of the, of the thing that pops up at the beginning, and then and then listen to it. And after that, they can forget about it. But but no, I think I think you've got a thing. You've got a groove. But Does, if I have Jurgen Klopp on Monday and Stormzy on Wednesday and Dan Tubb on Friday, maybe Jurgen, like Liverpool fans, who Jürgen, like Jurgen Klopp and Stormzy's yeah. uh, rap fans, like suddenly listen to Dan Tubb and go, huh. And then maybe the you talk... It's a, it's a network that we're building, yeah. Yeah, like I, I, I give Rogan as a great example. He just had um, Aaron Rodgers on the show. But yeah. with Aaron Rodgers, they're talking about this kind of stuff. Like yeah, yeah. how do we get this? Because what we need is we need this in... The interest in people in culture, sports, music to understand this stuff, mm. to be pushing back. That's what we need. Like, And so I, you know, I'm always like every day, I think about this every fucking day. You know, do I sacrifice having the Bitcoin show and take the gamble and go and do this wider thing? So, so because I feel like it's like if, we're, if, if this is like a, if, if we're in a war. No, because you're, you're, what, what you're thinking about there is you're, you're trying to be the whole network. No, I'm not. What I'm trying to think is if this is a war. Yeah. And we're trying to stop this. Mm -hmm. Doing it as a Bitcoiner comes with an agenda. Doing it as like just a, as a cultural layer comes – it's like the agenda's mm. different. Like how do we reach more people? Like I'm accepting that I sacrifice money and like opportunity and my niche position to go and try and reach more people with this. Like how do I do it? 
And how do we do it without sound like, because oh, that's that Bitcoin nutter is talking about the CBDCs, like fucking ignore him. Like it's, a, I, I'm wrestling with this on a daily basis. Yeah, I, I, I think you've got a really strong part of the network. And from that, you can branch out into other parts of the network and you, you can bring people. So, I mean, yeah, I am a Bitcoiner. Um, you know, I hold Bitcoin. I, I educate myself more and more on, on Bitcoin because Bitcoin, there was always more to learn. Um, but then my show isn't about Bitcoin. I'm, I'm going to cover it at some point. I haven't done that yet. So you're just you're just reaching out to the network mm. and bringing voices on and highlighting voices. And 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 this is when you start to learn about a subject. This is what happens. So I, mean, I can't remember who the first person I listened to when I started when I started going down my Bitcoin rabbit hole. I don't know who it was, but I listened to somebody, and I thought, oh, that person's good. So then I listened to an interview with that person with somebody else, and I thought, oh, that interview is quite good as well. And right. then, and then, it, like that interview interviewed somebody, else. and before you know it, you're you're in. You you just you're just populating outwards. So you've got a you've got a strong position on the network where you are now. Uh, it's not the whole network, but you know you're bringing me, and you said you're bringing Stormzy. No, no, I want to. Okay, right, fine. So um, <laughs> I'd love to have Stormzy on the show. And like, but I want some like him to understand this okay. and him to talk. Like I say, it was such a like watching Aaron Rodgers with Joe Rogan and saw the things they were talking about mm. and like those things that kind of sound like you may say they're conspiracy theories or nutters. Like, but they were having intelligent conversations about it. didn't they even talk about CBDCs on that? I don't know this. But he has talked about C like it's increasingly coming up. And I'm just like, I want that in the voices of the people of this country. Yeah. But it's like they're not gonna I'm not gonna reach massive audience who I am, but Stormzy might, or Ed Sheeran might, or Jurgen Klopp might. <laughs> <laughs> or Jude Bellingham. Yeah, I mean, it's still going to have to be good quality information. So, yeah. I mean, just just find interesting voices, bring them on, promote them. Um, and yeah, I, I think the key thing for me is a certain section of the audience will resonate and a certain section won't. So I do not expect to resonate with the old-fashioned lefties. I'm, yeah. I'm probably not going to connect with them particularly hard, but there will be a certain percentage who will say, okay, yeah, maybe there's something interesting there, and then they and then they find me on a conversation I have with somebody else, and they'll follow that other person as well. You know, the network sort of organically grows. So I think you are doing the right thing. Right, fair, in, term, in terms of what I do about it, because, I mean, I've, I've, I've been thinking the same thing as well. This is why I have not gone back into venture capital, um, even though I've, you know, I came out of it and then it just so happened we had lockdown at that time. Yeah. I could have then sort of gone back into it. And in fact, I could have gone back into it um, having had the benefit of two years going deep down the rabbit hole on cryptos. Um, but for me, actually, the most important thing is the messaging. Yeah. And so that's why I spend all my time now doing podcasts and radios and yeah, yeah. tweet threads and why I've joined Lotus Eaters, because I want to reach as many people as possible. And that's a completely different audience. That is more focused around, you know, politically, they're more the sensible centre. Um, it's it's more it's very much English orientated. It doesn't, well, maybe they do have American followers, but it's, it's very much sort of English orientated around that. And it's a lot of people who don't know anything about Bitcoin. Well, they've heard of it, but they, they don't know much about it. And I mm. will introduce that concept at some point. But the bigger thing for me is talking about how government is failing us at this point mm. and it is going to lead us to a bad place. And in order to save itself, it is going to become something like China. And yeah, it's never going to get all of the way there, but it's going to get something like that. Our freedoms are going to be removed. And more importantly, our ability to purchase anything through, well, just the effects of inflation. It's going to squeeze us and squeeze us and squeeze us. And we're not going to know what's happening. Well, some of us are going to know what's happening. We're going to understand why we can't afford to buy anything anymore. Mm. But we're going to get angry about it and we're going to turn to the government who caused the problem to provide the solution. And that solution is going to be universal basic income provided through a central bank digital currency. And once we're in that, we're trapped. So, so this is like the only thing where I, you know, two of your favourite guests... So two of my favourite guests on your show are probably Greg Foss and um, Jeff Booth, and, and and that's the only thing where I sort of vary from Jeff Booth a bit is that I is he seems to apply if I'm understanding correctly where he goes on this is that he thinks that this dark future that I'm talking about might be a step but then it will collapse fairly quickly. I'm a lot less optimistic that once we get into that that it will happen. But there was there was also an optimistic case for me. So so the good case is that. Um, this, this system is going to collapse and that um, the bad scenario is that it collapses but after the central bank digital currency route is viable. And so we go straight on to that. The good scenario is that this system collapses before that other thing is viable but Bitcoin is by then viable. Hmm. And look, let's say 
so all of these things, they always last longer than you think they do. Mm -hmm. I don't think the system is going to catastrophically collapse within this decade, but it is going to increasingly grind us down over the next decade. So let's imagine a scenario where in 2029, the rate of Bitcoin adoption and network, the user interface, the custody issues have been significantly improved and 70% of people are using it at least on some level by 2029. And at that point, the system collapses. Sovereign debt layer gets wiped out with stuff that Greg Foss talks about all the time. If 70% of people are using Bitcoin, you could just basically step from that one system to another. Because, I mean, we see, we've seen this before. You brought up the example of, of Argentina. Every so often, their system collapses. It doesn't really matter that much because they all just go to their top drawer and they pull out the dollars and they get on with life. But that's because they are uh, an island of chaos in a sea of stability. Whereas it's going to be the other way around if the Western financial system goes. It's just going to be the sea of, of instability and chaos. Um, and, and probably the, um, you know, the BRICS, if they, if they get their um, system set up in time, they're going to have some sort of insulation against it, but it's going, to be, it's going to be punishing. But if that Bitcoin option is viable at that time, potentially we step across to that. Hmm. And I don't know which of the routes we go, because it all, it all kind of depends on who's ready to go at the right time. So whether we end up in the good future or the bad future, for me it's like 60-40, and I don't know whether it's 60-40 bad or, or good, but... You know, there is, a, there is a good route out of this, but that's why I'm dedicating all of my time to talking about this message because it is so important. Because I think if we get the bad outcome, it could be a generational issue before we get out of it. Okay, a lot to think about, man. Um, we're going to have to follow up. Yeah, I'd love to. I think I would like to go... I almost want to do that next step now. I want to map out the, the bad future and map out the good future and how do we push the good future how do what can we do to do that i think that'd be a fascinating follow-up i feel like i uh, interrupted quite a few times just because i was so into it um dan danny knows when there's going to be a show i like and he was like uh, p you're gonna love this one thank you so much dan we will do a follow-up where should we send people like if they want to find out more yeah well um uh, you can follow me on twitter I've got a really stupid Twitter handle because um, I signed up like 12 years ago and I thought it was a bit of a joke platform. Uh, I didn't realise it was going to be a thing, but it was. So uh, King Bingo underscore, you can find me on Twitter. Um, and I very recently joined Lotus Eaters and I'll be starting my Brokenomics series there soon. So um, follow that and I'll be having content up hopefully very soon. Brilliant. Well, look, thank you for this. Um, yeah, let's plan another show. Thanks very much. All right. Cheers.